I'm Amy Vetter, and welcome to the Breaking Beliefs Podcast. This valuable time is for you to pause in your day and go on your own self journey. Discover the beliefs that are holding you back from living your best life at work and at home. Learn from the guests on this show as they share their inspirational stories on how they found ways to break internal beliefs that were no longer serving them. Because if you believe you can, you will. And our podcast begins now. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs, where I interview Grace Horvath, CEO and President of CPA America, a national association of independent accounting firms. She has driven the strategies for delivery of services and resources designed to increase firm growth, profitability, and sustainability provided to member firms since 2011. As the first female leader in its 43-year history since January 2022, Grace is excited to head the association into its next era of supporting member success and the evolution of the profession. Grace lives in Gainesville, Florida with her husband, John, who is a civil engineer. Her daughter recently relocated back home to Florida where she is an RNA scientist and just welcomed her first baby. Her son and his family live in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, so she is lucky enough to see them often. She is an avid reader and enjoys cooking, entertaining, traveling, and spoiling her dogs. During this interview with Grace, we discuss what it takes to create a succession plan for leadership, what are the tips of transa- transitioning not only for yourself, but your replacement, and how to take in feedback to be successful. I hope you enjoy this interview with Grace and like, subscribe, or share with people that are also could use these tips that Grace is providing during this interview. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs. I am excited to have Grace Horvath from CPA America here today, and this is my second time talking to Grace. So Grace, you wanna give a brief introduction of yourself before we get started? Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Amy. Um, This is my second time, so I I feel quite honored to be uh, invited back. That means I must not have messed up too badly the first time. (laughs) Uh, But I am, as you mentioned, Grace Horvath. I am the president of CP America. We are a national association of independent accounting firms. I've been with the association since 2011 and took over as president in 2022. Yeah, so we had such a great conversation. I was looking back and Grace was my eighth episode. So if you want to go back and uh, and listen to the episode in 2019, we were actually at a CPA America event in Hawaii uh, right before quarantine. So we were so lucky to get that event in <laughs> before uh, everything was shut down. But uh, Grace's story was so incredible of just her upbringing and everything she had been through in her life and really, you know, breaking through that generation and being the first to go to college and really, you know, make, you know, a success of herself and having the example, I think, of your mother and grandmother and so forth. So... Now, since we talked last time, and definitely go back and listen to that episode with her story, uh, Grace has transitioned into being the CEO of CPA America. And how long have you been with CPA America? What was your beginnings with CPA America? I I started in 2011. Um, My first day was, oh, wow. It was the Leading Partners Retreat. I had been hired as part of the succession plan of my predecessor, who probably a lot of people listening to the podcast will know was Kathy McDonald. And she was really a, a, a force du jour and, and, you know, quite some shoes to fill. And uh, that was back in September of 2011. And I started as a director. I moved up to vice president over time. Um, and then uh, competed for the president's position. And I, 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 I can tell you that if you were to ask me this, like, hey, do you consider yourself to be a person who 
always wants to be the first one to do something. No, but I'm actually now also the first female president of the association and we are in our 43rd year. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I think it's an important conversation because so many people are with organizations for a long time and, you know, people get used to you in certain roles and every transition that you make, whether it's from director to vice president to president is, you know, you've got this respect for the people that were there and what they did and then what your new vision is going to be and how you transition that. And so maybe you can talk about that first transition, because I think it's important, especially that you said you were hired to be a successor. So many firms that I work with don't actually identify successors in every role of the organization and have that bench strength. So what was that process like when you knew you were a successor? How were they grooming you to make sure you were ready for the next role? One of the most profound things that Alan Deichler, my former boss and the former president of Seek America said to me when I started was, uh, I want you to learn and observe, understand who we are, what we do, and what members need, but I'm not asking you to do it the same way we've always done it. Um, and he was very em emphatic about that, that my, my goals and objectives were not to recreate the processes that were in place. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't know what they were, I was just so completely brand new to everything it's not like those things came second nature to me. I, I knew nothing mm -hmm. about the organization. And um, Kathy at the time was also taking on some initiatives that she wanted to do as, as part of her kind of swan song programs and services that she was still working with. And so I was really thrown into it where I had the benefit of the historical knowledge both in the building and in the files, literally the paper files. <laughs> uh, but I also had the uh, support and the autonomy to do things in a different way. And it's when you're coming from the outside or, or when you're coming from not being in that position, I should say, you, you look at the way something is done, you learn how it's done, and you go, wow, there could be a better way to do this. Or it's not necessarily a better way. It's just that you think about it differently, and you're going to have a different approach than the person before you. And how are, you know, maybe you can talk about how you approach that, because especially you know, people can say they're fine with you wanting yeah. to do things different. And then when you start doing things different, they're like, oh, but we did it this way because yeah. of X and you start hitting some roadblocks. So what was the best way for you to communicate up uh -huh. and manage up in order to be successful in making changes? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. The uh, one piece of that was just circumstantial luck and that my predecessor went and purchased property in a large retirement area here in Florida. Mm -hmm. And whereas I think initially she was hesitant to step back when she discovered what was uh, ahead of her, she got so excited. She really got out of the way. <laughs> and so a, a lot of what I was able to do, I didn't really get any resistance because the institutional, um, methodologies were, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the, the, the author of those next to me all the time. And, and I know I see in some of our member firms, that's a real struggle. And especially mm -hmm. if you've got a young, uh, somebody who comes into the firm very young and they grow up underneath the senior partners and managing partners, and they're very much mentor, boss, uh, supervisor, coach all those things and and i can say that this is something i felt this somewhat transitioning from me to alan the hardest part about the transition is you don't want to do anything that's just perceived as disrespectful or or coming off as 
you know, okay, wow, thank goodness your tenure is coming to an end because we're ready to do things my way, which are going to be better. And it, it's not really like that. Right. But it, it, it is definitely a challenge when your predecessor is still around and still very much the, the leader, the figurehead in every single way to start establishing your own way of doing things. It's a, it's a tightrope to walk. Mm-hmm. It is. So uh, you, when, when you knew a year before you were going to become president, is that correct? They announced it. So, you know, we actually knew two years before, okay. and that was, I don't know that a two-year runway is necessary. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. But we are so transparent in how we answer to our members, and our, our members knew that Alan was approaching retirement, and so they were just chomping at the bit. They wanted to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And our board of directors had thought, if we have to do an outside search, this could really take a long time. Mm -hmm. So we need to determine what's going on with the internal candidate, which was me. And was I going to have the qualifications that they were looking for to do the job or was, or were they going to open it up and allow me to compete with others? Mm -hmm. And so we went through a very rigorous process with an outside coach, uh, all kinds of 360 evaluations where we looked at not only me as an individual, but we looked at the position of president and CEO and, and what the members thought that job should be doing. Mm -hmm. and, and the type of person they thought should be in it. And the next thing I know, I had, I turned out through this process to, to be aligned as a very good match for what the membership thought was needed in, in the role. And it, and it just happened soon. So it was January of 2020. Well, okay, then all hell broke loose. And, uh, you know, and we had a very strong transition plan in place. And when I take a look at our firms who, who are, who go through transition, some of them have very, very strong plans in place. And for others, it's just, Hey, we're winging it. And when I'm out of the seat, you'll come into the seat and you do things your way. Um, but we were extremely methodical about it with the first year. It was just kind of like, okay, we know the decision's been made. Now we don't need to worry about it. Right. And pandemic came along and we had plenty of other things to think about. Right. And then in 21 is when we actually started the, the process of slowly beginning to hand, hand off work a piece at a time or levels of responsibility, I should say. So uh, with that being transparent um, that you were going to be the next president, how did that affect you in your current role or... Were, were you toggling, you know, two positions during that time period? Or, you know, how was that working in order for you to be ready? So there were there were multiple layers to that. And there's the actual layer of physical demand that's required because we we named then my successor and we thankfully were able to find we had an internal candidate here who i know you know jen walker and um we had this revelation i was like wait a second i didn't start here as vice president i started here as a director and so maybe we don't need to go out and find another vice president i've been here so long maybe we can look more towards a director and if we do that we have somebody here who is phenomenal but then so then what happens is you have this one year period where I'm learning to, to do the job of president and starting to take on some of the responsibilities. And as an example, okay, here you go. You got to do the budget and you got to start doing all the prospecting, which as you know, is it, it's a physical requirement of your time and attention. And I'm still doing my job as vice president and then teaching Jen how to do that job when she's on the way up. So it, it was, it was very, very demanding to say the least. The, the flip side of that was that Alan was very 100% committed to fulfilling his responsibilities and being present and mindful and staying in that position of leader until the end of his tenure. So it, it 
at the end of the day, until 12.31, 2021, you know, the buck was still stopping at Alan Deichler. And I got to step in and take that on in, in 22. So, uh, and, and I think this is important as people are taking on new roles and, um, you know, elevated leadership positions. What was um, your process? So you have worked there for a long time, so you have your ideas, but where did you go out to learn? You know, I, I, I know that you said that they interviewed the members and so forth, but what did you do yourself before you made any changes to kind of assess what changes were going to be made once you became president, besides what you knew um, already of the role? Well, I had always been involved at the level of leadership and with our board of directors and had my hands in strategy. I mean, my, my, my job was to drive that. It, it was in the, in the time leading up to now, you know, Alan would be, you know, we had ideas and things like, hey, we need, we need to do something for next gen. You know, we need to um, have a program that's going to help firms with recruiting and retaining and building bench strength. And so I would take that and, and run with it. So I, I had the, the, the knowledge of like, okay, the, 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 you know, here's the architect, right? Here, here's something, we need to fill this particular space and it needs to have this particular function and it needs to be really great. So build that. And so I did have a lot of that knowledge coming into it, which was a deep understanding of the members, what they want. And over time, one thing we've never wavered on is staying very clear and steadfast to our objective. Why are we in business? What is What are we supposed to be doing? And so when it came time to make changes, honestly, there were some things that I was a little bit excited about because, you know, I am very different than my predecessor and I knew I would approach things differently when given the opportunity to, to do so. But I was just patient and waited till it was my turn. Yeah, which I think is really important because, you know, with with any change, um, you know, I think it's great, like you said, whether you need two years, you know, is to be seen, but to have that time where people start getting to know you in a different way or seeing right. you in a different way is really important with, with, you know, it's not just identifying a successor, it's being, it's letting people know that is your successor. Right. So um, people start seeing you, right. you know, as that next leader which a lot of times doesn't happen. But uh, the same time is how you kind of filter through change when you're excited to go as a leader to make some structural changes and things like that and having yeah. to pace it um, yeah. with everybody else's temperament. So how did you mm -hmm. approach that? Well, going back to what I was talking about the methodology, and I think that this is what I wish we could see in more member firms where there was more intentional succession, because when you have the luxury of that time, you really can build, you can vet the person that's going to be taking the role. Mm -hmm. So that it's removed a, a lot of the uncertainty as to how you think this person is going to perform because they've had time to people have had time to think about it and question it and possibly even work with that person on what they know will be different. Right. Um, but we see that all the time. I mean, you see major, you know, fortune 500 companies and who was it recently with Starbucks. So the main guy's stepping down and a new guy's coming in. And that was, you know, nobody except for probably an inside circle. Nobody knew that was coming. Right. Right. So I, I don't know that, you know, in order to have a successful transition that there needs to be this super long runway right? or the buy-in, you have to be ready to just do it. You know, listening to people is very important, listening to what they, to, to what they want. And I, Amy, I am really, just because of my background, I think, in sales and, and always, you, you just have to, you have to put yourself in the opposite set of shoes from you and don't think about what, what am I thinking, but think about what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And 
I prioritize making sure that people understand expectations and that I understand, I understand what, what they need to feel comfortable. Right. Yeah. So we talked a lot about, um, your mother, your, even on your father's side, um, his mother and your grandmother and their work ethic. Where do you think you see that come into yourself? Like you come into a role like this, do you ever kind of flash back into certain memories or things that they told you growing up or, you know, um, to help keep you motivated? that's helped you now or that's kind of in the back of your head taking on a role like this, giving you confidence? Well, that you you need to be reliable. You need to mm-hmm. do what you say you're gonna do. And, you know, getting into a position of, of leadership like this is, um, if, you, if you really sit there and start picking apart and thinking about it, it can be terrifying, right? Right, <laughs> right. Because there's so much at stake. Mm-hmm. And we 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 joke here, and when when thing when when things are not going as planned, or, or when there's you know things that relative to what we do could be considered crises, we try to put that into perspective and say nobody's going to die at the end of the day here. You right. know, we're not performing surgery; we haven't killed anybody. Um, but even then, nonetheless, it, it is important that what we do is is done to the degree of excellence, which is impossible to achieve and still get things, which is possible to achieve and still get things done. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I have to think back about, you know, what my background, it's that it was the tenacity. Yeah. It, It was the tenacity that you just, you just don't put your hands up and walk away. You're like, no, I can, I can figure this out. Yeah. And, and I have found that too, where things might seem really overwhelming. There's just so much to get done. And, and then everyone around you, that's your team is getting stressed out about all these things. And, and I think, uh, you know, with what you talked about and the importance of having a plan yeah. in place so that you're only focused on what we said we were going to do this month and and eventually we'll get to that vision in 12 months, two years or whatever. But if you start thinking about everything, that's when your mind starts blowing apart and it's like just staying focused on what's ahead of you and you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to do that. And you, you, you have to give yourself time to, to reflect. And there's a, 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 a required degree of self-awareness that when you start to feel overwhelmed Mm -hmm. or you encounter a situation that you've never encountered before, which how could you not? Right. I mean, if this is the first time you've ever been a president or a CEO and the first time you've ever been the one who's ultimately making the decisions, half the stuff you come across is going to be the first time. Right. And so you, you, just have to put that in perspective, relate it to what you are clear your objectives are to be, and just, you know, check yourself and where your decisions are coming from. Are they coming from emotion or are they coming from reason? And it's okay to be emotional, but you need to decide how and when you're going to do that. And not when you're trying to make a critical decision. Yeah. Or when you're, or when people are looking to you to be solid. And so you need to be very, very, uh, so I guess solid is the best word. I'm sure there's a better word yeah. for it than that, but you know, a rational thinker, a leader. Yeah. That they feel like they can, you're dependable or reliable. Yeah. Like, like you said, I mean, I, um, think is, you know, um, the thing about leadership is it can be very lonely, <laughs> you know, yeah. on one hand, um, and that self-awareness of getting present and really understanding that. Cause I think the other thing that comes in, um, like you said, is, you know, um, being aware of whether you're being rational or is emotion or is it ego. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times what I see in a lot of leadership and firms is like not breaking down new things or, you know, it's more about ego versus what's best for the company, which 
you you know that's that self-awareness piece that is really right. good to get back to because what's best for the company not for yeah. me or any individual right right and it's i think it's uh, people should be have a lot of clarity on the difference between the um, um, ego and competitiveness and ambition because mm -hmm. i think it's okay to want to be the best yes you know it's like oh I, w I would like to run the most mediocre association no <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like right. you want your members to just be like wow we are we just love everything we get out of that membership right um and you got to be com com competitive to do that right um but still with it you know it's that patrick lencion uh uh oh my gosh i'm, I'm those people who will read it will remember it. you need to be it's hungry humble and smart yes and, well and, and like to your point of competitiveness like you want to be making sure you're always doing your best but if you're always looking to the person or association or firm next to you to make it, well, they're doing this or they're doing that, it's like, no, what is best for us? Right. You right. know, because a lot of times I've gotten those situations in business and your staff's even like, you know, oh, well, I see them doing that. It's like, but what are right. we about? What is our values? What is our mission? And what's going to separate us? Right. You know, that why someone would come to us versus somebody else. Right. And you have to, you, you have to stick to that. It's, you know, for our member firms, not every client is a fit. Mm -hmm. And for, I noticed for our firms that are really accelerating as the most profitable, the most progressive and having the best time with their people yeah. are the ones who have really made a strong determination. This is who we are and this is who we serve. And we're not going to, every client that comes to the door, we may love them, but it just might not be the right client for us. Mm -hmm. And I think and, it's and it makes those it's leadership easy. decisions easier. Oh, it's yeah. It's it's every, every time way. you're like, is it aligned with our values? Right. Yes or no. <laughs> right. And there, there are firms out there who are looking for things that we don't offer and they're, oh, they're just lovely firms. I mean, it would be great to have them as a member, but they're, we don't, we, we're, we don't offer what they need. Right. They're looking for something different. And so it, it, we have to be careful as an association. We're never going to be all things to all people, all things to every firm. Um, yeah, I suppose if we had, you know, a thousand people working here and an unlimited budget. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that not being the case. Yeah. Uh, you know, it and it and it it, it helps it, it it streamlines it from the top down. Yeah. So that for your your team and your people in place, they know that they're they're in an environment where innovation and fresh ideas, uh, and refusing to say that's the way we've always done it are core values. But on the flip side of that, we're able to stay focused and not just be all over the place like having squirrels running through the building. Exactly. Know? Yeah. And that's what you see a lot. So you said you did a 360 process. I don't know how often you do it. I'd love to hear that. But what have you learned about yourself as a leader through that process? And what have you pivoted or changed um, from those learnings? I definitely had to work on my communication and I continue to work on that. And for anybody who's coming in, who's transitioning into a position of leadership, I am a, such a huge advocate of executive coaching. Mm -hmm. And you said something uh, earlier about how it's it's lonely at the top, and you know it's, it's a relative term, but but it, it is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's not not only is there really not anybody internally for you to vent to when 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 you got to work through the emotion of something. There's also not anybody who's really going to come in and tell you, hey, you need to be thinking about doing something better. Like yeah. You're, you're doing something in a particular way and it's and it's um, it's not helping you achieve what you need to achieve. Right. And you can get that through um, through a mentor, through a trusted friend. You know, I happen to have um, I'm 
so lucky that a couple of my my close girlfriends are are also preseason executives and they'll tell it like it is um but working with an executive coach and this will be maybe the third time i've done it and each time you do a 360 um it's consistent you see where your your strengths are and i think it's important to see where your strengths are yeah because most people and if you know a good leader and you do you know maintain some some humility and you're a little bit humble you don't think you tend to do anything good yeah so so it's really nice when you when you get some validation and the flip side of that is you get that feedback for the things you need to continue working on and I know for me personally, it's communication, which would probably be about 99.9% of the population. And what does that mean when you say communication? Maybe you can give an example of what you mean. That, that both people or all the people in the room walk out of the room with the same understanding of the conversation. Yeah. I, I have a great quote from a yoga retreat I was on, but he had said, um, the myth about communication is that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I always find that so because it's like whatever you come in with in your head or from a prior meeting or what you don't know what's coloring somebody else's perception yeah. and how you make sure that you're repeating things enough that people take away the messages yeah. and whatever yeah. feelings are blocking your messages, right. you know, is so important. There's a wonderful book I recommend. It's not an easy read, but it's Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Straight no. Have you read it? Uh, I, I haven't read it, but I've, I've, I've yeah. read it on a podcast with a part of it. very enlightening when you really just accept that most of the time you, you cannot know or understand who you're talking to. Yeah. Um, and, and, I don't know that the book is not necessarily so much about communication. It's about how we have to quit putting our beliefs and assumptions on onto others and making our own reality out of that. Right. But it's the same thing. If you're leading members, if you're leading a staff, if you're leading people, you know, I go in just, I just don't assume that anybody knows what I said. So how do you make sure that they do? So one of the things we're doing internally, and I actually am asking my staff to hold me accountable on this, is that when we conclude a meeting or communication, or I I got dinged, this is a good one. And it was so true. I'm like, yep, making decisions, coming time to execute, whatever that is, weeks, months later, and I'll pop up and say, what what is this? Where did this come from? Who decided this? And they'll look at me and say, you did. (laughs) So like okay okay you're you're absolutely right and thankfully it was not anything detrimental but that's that's frustrating you know right so it was like what are you guys gonna have to record me yeah so uh, so we've started um making it a a habit that when we make a decision of something or we meet together as a group um that we can conclude that with some sort of minutes or something some documentation that it's like hey Here's, here's the things we decided on. Here's what's left outstanding. And here's who's doing what. Uh, and it might even be, here's what we talked about and decided that we're killing this and we're not talking about it anymore. So don't bring it up again. Right. <laughs> um, but just holding each other accountable that, that everybody's walking away with clarity. Which is, uh, I, I, I love that idea of just making sure that everybody heard everything um and and it's clear on what the actions are because so many times there's meetings with no action Um, that's the worst a lot of you know conversation of things you should do but then it's like well when will it get done right no that is um if you have a team of high performers you cannot you're not going to keep them that way because yeah. nothing is more frustrating than to spend time and get nothing out of it. Yeah. I mean, nothing. So after your first year, what are some things that you would suggest? Um, you know, I mean, I know January was official, but, um, you know, but you kind of had a year of transition ahead of it. 
would you give advice to other people coming into a leadership position looking back of you know some tips that they should take coming into you know leading an organization a firm or wherever they are i would say make sure you have as much information as you can about the organization and and whether or not you're coming from you're coming internally or whether you're coming from the outside and you really want to understand the, the history, you know, really know, know what it is you're dealing with because, you know, and especially if you're walking in new to a place, you don't want to be like, why haven't we done this before? And it was something that just colossally failed, you know, several months before you got there, you know, um, I, I would highly recommend the coaching. I, I just highly would recommend having somebody to, help you work through and, you know, go in with an understanding of where your strengths and your weaknesses are, identify the things that you want to work on and, and formulate your plan and then work with somebody to hold you accountable to sticking to that. And, you know, Amy, sometimes that even includes things like mindfulness, Mm -hmm. uh, taking some time to meditate, um, doing certain exercises and going through things to make sure that you don't become overwhelmed Right. Um, so yeah, it's not just about getting the job done. It's also about being well. Yeah. And controlling your energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, no, I love that. And I think, um, talking about how important it is with an executive coach and, you know, they're, uh, you know, one of the hard parts about leadership is the further you go in leadership, the less feedback you get because people are afraid to speak up or, You know, I mean, you can create the environment the best that you can, but having someone with no skin in the game (laughs) that can give you feedback is is really important. And maybe even shadowing you in meetings or wherever you can bring them in to help with that. So uh, so these are some great tips and, you know, so excited about the things that you're doing with CPA America. And I always love working with. CPA America, your team and and the firms there. Uh, We're actually launching a CAS collaboration in August. So that's really exciting. Uh, It will be in Indianapolis and having a whole workshop for the firms of CPA America that are looking to understand how to build that foundation in their practice. That's it, it's a, it's on fire. It's on fire. I like it. Yeah. I would give. I would. I would get. I. I I'm going to give you one more thing. I would tell people to do, and it just awesome. reminds me of like, and it's like me talking to you today. Not not the podcast part, but before the podcast started recording, just the conversation we were having prior. Yeah. I would tell anybody making the transition to ask questions. Mm-hmm. They need to reach out reach out to people in the profession, people that in similar positions, you know, talk to people, get educated and ask questions. It's always okay to say, I don't know. Can you help me learn more about this? Yes. Yeah. And you never know different perspectives as well that might add into what you're already doing, which is, you know, so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Being open to that. But here's the task. That's going to be amazing. I'm very excited. I know the members are excited. Yeah. And we'll be, we're going to be in Louisville. Louisville. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I was there for um, the marketing, uh, the marketers meeting and we do a marketing round table there and I got in somewhat early and uh, I needed something to do, kill some time. And I decided to go for a walk and I said, there's a, there's a river. It's a nice day out. That's a, I'll just walk across that bridge. And I really had not paid attention to where I was. So I'm like, man, this is long. Like this is a long walk. And it's like, (laughs) it's like a mile to get across this river. And I walked to the other side of the bridge and there's the sign. Welcome to Indiana. Like I have really walked to another state. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's funny. It was, it was, but we'll, that's where we'll be staying. So it's a good, a good part of town for getting out and about. Yeah, that's great. So uh, last time I, I always end with, uh, you know, some rapid fire questions and I'm going to challenge you to pick a different category because okay. last time you picked family and friends. 
So the other categories um, are money, spiritual, and health. Um, let's talk about money. Okay. So things or actions I don't have that I want with money. I do not have a deep enough understanding about very sophisticated investing. Mm. Yeah. And having the time. To... <laughs> and having the time to figure that out. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Things or actions that I do have that I want as far as money. I have a good handle on how to be responsible with it. Yes. Yeah. And I think that comes from upbringing too, right? Like, yeah. you know, coming from the background, it's, it's like just making sure you never end up that way. <laughs> I always have that fear from <laughs> losing everything, you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, things or actions I don't have that I don't want. Losing sight of what's important in pursuit of money. Mm, good one. <laughs> Yes, I think a lot of people get distracted. And I also think with age, it changes. I don't know. At least for me, it yeah. has, you know. Um, yeah. I know I've kind of flipped to be how much do I actually need versus how much can I make, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, things or actions that I do have that I don't want. I still have a paper bills. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I still, I honestly, I hate when they go paperless. Cause then I forget I've gotten an email about it and yeah, I, <laughs> I'm I know. so bad about that. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so many great lessons. Is there anything you want to make sure people walk away with from our talk today, um, that we haven't talked about, or maybe something you want to reemphasize? I would just emphasize where the opportunity exists to take your succession planning very seriously and whether or not you're, you're looking at internal candidates or whether you're having to go outside the organization, but have a plan. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. And then this is just such a great example of what you guys did and for other people to think about. So thank you so much for being on again, Grace. And thank as you. always, uh, so many great tips and uh, interesting stories. So yeah, I enjoyed talking to you and I'll see you soon. Yes, I will see, yeah. you. We'll see you soon. Talk to you later. Bye bye. And now for my mindful moments with my interview with Grace Horvath. And for those of you that want to hear her backstory, that is episode eight of the podcast. She had so many good stories from growing up that really helped develop her into this leader today. And I had her back on because I think it's so important to talk about succession planning and leadership and the process that CPA America went through to bring her in as president and also to set her up for success. So Grace was actually with the organization since 2011, but always was in a position of being a successor for somebody else. And I think a lot of times when we think about succession planning, we only think about it for the highest level, not thinking about it for every level of the organization and where your bench strength is and making sure that people know how to do each other's jobs and are ready for that next role. So that if you see gaps that you can identify that early and ensure that they are going to be ready to take on that role. Secondly, what is important about succession planning is that not only that person knows that you see them in that role, that the people around them also see them in that role. And so when they eventually transition into that role, that they are accepted as that next leader. And so we talked a lot about just this process of being in waiting for that next level. Or when you become a new leader, the process of getting people the mindset around change and innovation and the things that you wanna do. And one of the things that we really talked about is even as excited as she was, this was really a two-year process, is that they went through a selection process and announced it two years prior to her becoming president and the transition didn't actually happen 
for a year prior to her being president. So there was lots of time to be able to train her, get her ready for this role, and also be looking out for who was the best person to take on her role and, and so forth. And having the time to look internally and externally, but making sure that they did put a priority on internal candidates first because of knowing the organization, the customers, the clients, and so forth is a much easier transition than bringing in someone brand new. So one of the things that she talked about was not doing anything that would be disrespectful and challenge the predecessor while they're around. I think as respectful as someone can be that someone is taking their role, there's always that personal feeling about someone taking your job, even if you're ready to go on and do your next best thing, that there's just respect to give to someone of the work that they've done, the progress that they've made, and around the leader who they are. You don't want to overshine those people until it's time for them to move on and uh, you're able to start making the changes that you want. The other thing was the transparency that they let all the members know the process and the staff and so forth. So they were ready for this. And the people that were selecting the next leader were doing 360 evaluations. They were taking in feedback of staff and members of what they thought the qualities of this next president and CEO should be in order to match it to the right profile. So I think this is a lot of the work that doesn't get done in job descriptions is really doing that research work of what is the job description, not thinking about any one person. Because too often we are thinking about who we want in that job and just fitting them into it rather than knowing if they really meet the criteria of what's needed in the organization. That just because you have that job description before, what has evolved over time and what are the new initiatives that you need to think about and then match the candidate to see if they are a fit to that so that you're profiling the job description It's not personal. And it's very clear where the gaps are with the candidates. So she talked about that transition period being a struggle with toggling new responsibilities and old responsibilities, but still having her predecessor there to help, to support her, and do his work while she was transitioning other people into their roles as well. And really staying clear on the objective of the company. So once you get into that role, with any change that you're gonna make, understanding what is the value proposition of what you do as a business, even if you need to redefine that. But making sure you take the time to do that first before you start making changes to ensure that the changes you are making align with the value proposition of the organization. And this intentional succession planning, she you know, really gives credence to the fact that it removes uncertainty of the people that work in this corporation, the customers as well, so that they feel comfortable with what is going on in the organization and feel like they understand uh, what's happening next. We also talked about how important it is to listen first before making changes and really try to put yourself in others' shoes so that you can understand what their expectations are. So when you are developing new strategy and so forth, you're taking that into account. And then to really think about what is hard for everybody is, you know, when you're going through change, there's big plans and really starting to realize not only for yourself, but how hard it is for everyone or if something is going wrong you know, not harping on that too much and losing sight of the bigger vision and making sure that you have brought everyone along with you on that journey. So she really talked about the importance of giving herself time to reflect, making sure she's very self-aware 
of how she is feeling and what things that she needs to do to reset so that she's not making decisions out of emotion, but instead being rational and reasonable and doing the best thing for the company versus herself. And we did have a discussion about the difference in ego versus competitiveness versus ambition, which a lot of times can get in the way of leadership. When we take us out of it, we usually will come to the right decision of the company. And also we talked about the importance of executive coaching, that when you become a leader, that less and less feedback comes to you. And so having someone that doesn't have skin in the game to be able to give feedback to you is really important so that you can continue to improve even though you're a leader in an organization that you never stop striving to be better. So there, she gave three tips at the end of this that I think was really important that coming in as a new leader is to make sure you have as much information as you can about the organization, understand their history and respect it. Make sure you have an executive coach to help you through your strengths and weaknesses and hold you accountable to making the changes that you need to make. And make sure that you're asking questions of people outside of your organization, but maybe still in that industry or profession so that you can learn more and make sure you're feeding that information back into the organization. So, so many great tips here for leadership and really getting out of your belief system so that you make the best decisions for an organization. I want to thank Grace for being on and uh, hopefully you'll look into CPA America as well if you are an accounting firm that's looking for an association to help you with resources. And if any of these lessons are helpful to you, make sure to share, like, subscribe to this podcast. And I look forward to sharing the next interview with you soon. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Breaking Beliefs podcast. I hope you will take a moment to pause before entering back into your day to reflect on this podcast and note one to two actions you are inspired to do from today's conversation that you could incorporate into your life. To read the full blog and listen back to this episode or any other, you can find them at www.amyvetter.com forward slash Breaking Beliefs Podcast and related videos on my YouTube channel. For daily inspiration, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Amy Vetter CPA. I hope that you will choose to like this and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and more so that you can join us for more inspiration on our next episode.